today we'll be discussing the top questions which keep uh, cropping up about diabetes and COVID-19 disease. Is the disease, does diabetes make you more at risk? Does it give you more severe disease? Is the treatment different, etc., etc. And I hope that by the end of this conversation, you will get, you will come away with more knowledge and more practical information. In an otherwise stable young person with diabetes, there are at the moment no data which indicate that they are at a higher risk of acquiring the disease. Obviously, if there are elderly people who have got uncontrolled diabetes or, and or other comorbidities, the risk may be higher. But an, otherwise, a vast majority of a stable young population with diabetes is unlikely to be at higher risk. However, it's very pertinent to point out that if a person with diabetes, especially those with uncontrolled sugars, does acquire the disease, the, the course of the disease in them tends to be more severe and the outcomes therefore also tend to be more adverse. Therefore, saying that they will require more aggressive care, they may require ventilatory support, that they have a higher chance of mortality than somebody who doesn't have these problems is also a reality of the situation. And they should take exactly the same precautions uh, and with obviously exercising as much care and stringency as everybody else has been advised. And I think this is critical to understand that the maximum transmission is having it is going through fomites, therefore by touch, and the repeated instruction, therefore, of keeping your hands clean as much as possible, and even when they're clean, avoiding any touch on the face, because we have three potential entry points, the nose, the mouth, and the eyes, and therefore keep your face, keep your hands clean, and avoid taking your hands near the face. Um, at the moment, social distancing by and large means minimizing the likelihood of an aerosol actually landing on you. And the second thing, of course, is that the more you're out, the more you're touching things, the, the difficulty in keeping your hands clean and preventing an unconscious or a subconscious you know, touch of the face by your own hands, that's something which has to be avoided. You're going, at the moment, there is no recommendation that you discontinue your walks. There is no recommendation that you totally stop essential shopping. However, as and when there are options which are equally effective and logistically simple, the same can be done. You can possibly, if you have a treadmill at home and you have the option between treadmilling at home and going out for a walk, possibly people will say the treadmill may be a better option at this point in time. So as of now, uh, there are no data which says that people with type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes are more or less at risk or more or less likely to have severe disease compared to one another. However, I think the, the underlying crux will be how, to what extent are there disease, is there you know, glucose control out of control because uncontrolled diabetes really does contribute to pure, poor immunity, poor function of the uh, cells of the immune system which can combat viruses. Testing strategy, as of today, uh, and, I, and, I, and these things can change depending on new data, is that you will be tested if you've had either traveled to one of the countries, and there's a list which the government has provided, or you've been in contact with an individual who has turned out to be uh, a, a positive for the disease. If you, follow, if you fall in these two categories and you have symptoms of disease, just like any other person, you are expected to go and uh, declare yourself for testing. And again, there's a list of centers where you are triaged, there's a list of centers where samples can be collected, and then there's a list of centers where the samples are sent for testing. So the primary symptoms in people with COVID-19, whether you have diabetes or not, are gonna be very similar because they are a manifestation of where the virus attacks and that's predominantly a respiratory tract, the upper respiratory tract and then the lower respiratory tract. But as I said earlier, the likelihood of more severe disease and therefore more uh, severe lower respiratory infection, that is the likelihood of pneumonia, more extensive pneumonia, uh, infection uh, and if impact on ventilation and therefore requiring support for ventilation, maybe uh, intubation, is more likely in people if they have diabetes, which is either poorly controlled or there are several other comorbidities with that. 
So again, as of, as of now, there's no diet which is specifically uh, advised. It's a respiratory virus. It'll target your upper and lower respiratory tracts. And uh, there are no clear sort of um, data that a particular foodstuff is going to boost your immunity, specifically in the context of COVID-19. Uh, if you see now the governmental uh, advisory for this is to shut down all eating places which are serving on site so you can order food but remember the person who's carrying the food may have maybe an asymptomatic stage so if you touch that food or objects again washing your hands and ensuring that you've not inadvertently acquired infection from somebody who was handling the container the general precautions about hand cleanliness is very critical in terms of food you will inevitably you know take your hand near the face because you're going to put your food in the mouth and therefore all precautions to that effect must be uh, clearly thought through so you know there's a there's a, a theoretical argument which has been put forth uh, based on prior knowledge and the prior knowledge says that this virus uh, enters cells through a certain receptor which is called the ACE2 receptor and that this receptor may be more available or accessible in people who are on the drugs which you mentioned namely ACE inhibitors, enalapril, ramipril, you know agents which often are ending with the word pril or angiotensin receptor blockers like losartan, termisartan, olmisartan, valsartan, agents which are ending with sartan. Now this is a theoretical possibility which has been put forth. At the moment there are again no data which have demonstrated that people who were on these medication were independent of their underlying disease state. So let's say the person with diabetes or heart disease who was on these medication. So independent of their underlying heart or diabetes conditions, they became at higher risk or at risk for more severe disease, right? And therefore, in this regard, the currently updated recommendations from professional associations, both in North America and in Europe, whether they are hypertension guidelines or cardiology guidelines, clearly indicates that if you're on these medication, you can continue to remain on them unless and until new data makes us change that recommendation. So please don't worry about these medications. Please continue to use them because controlling your health status your hypertension, your heart, your heart risk with these medicines possibly outweighs any theoretical disadvantage which may ensue because of the upregulation of the receptors as has been uh, reported. So you need to do whatever is required to keep your glucose and your other parameters well under control. If that requires insulin therapy, you need to continue with that. If that requires oral medication, you need to continue to do that. If you even acquire, if you, even if you become ill, you need to continue your medication and follow what are called sick day guidelines, which are generic for any person with diabetes who's ill in terms of more frequent testing of sugars at home, ensuring that your temperature stays down, ensuring that you continue to get nutrition. And if you're not taking solid nutrition, liquid nutrition, warm fluids, so that you remain well hydrated. So you need to follow all the sick day guidelines, uh, if, even if you suspect yourself to have acquired an upper respiratory or a low respiratory infection.